Good afternoon. Can I help you? Hi, yes. I'm looking for Mrs. Anna Parker. It's Miss, but I'm a bit long in the tooth for that, aren't I? You can just call me Anna. What can I do for you? Could I also call you Bonnie? No, you cannot. But that's you, isn't it? Bonnie Byrne, the sole survivor of the Lady Claire? You're not looking for a seamstress, are you? What gave it away? You're holding a tape recorder, and you didn't bring a dress. It's hard to get alterations on a garment if you don't bring a garment with you. I hadn't thought of that. Listen, I just want to know your side of the story, Bonnie. Bonnie Byrne is gone. Everyone knows that. My name is Anna Parker, and if you do not address me as such, you're welcome to leave the same way that you came in. I'm sorry. Anna. <sighs> You'll not be finding any stories here. And since you don't have anything that needs alterations, I think we're done. Wait, wait, don't walk away! My name is Emily Sullivan! My grandfather was the captain of that ship! What? My grandfather was Captain James Sullivan, and one of the few things that survived that wreck was his journal. My uncle, who was the last Sullivan to live at our family estate, died a year ago. We had to sell the place to resolve his debts. My mother and I ended up having to clear out the main house before it was put up for sale. Under the desk in his office was a safe that contained his important documents, and a waterlogged, old, leather-bound journal. I opened it and knew right away what it was, but I didn't tell anyone. I slipped it in my bag and brought it home. I read it cover to cover in one night. After I finished reading, I knew I had to find you. But you didn't make it easy. No. No, I wouldn't, would I? My parents bought me a ticket aboard that ship as a gift for completing my apprenticeship in dressmaking. I was supposed to go to the English countryside to work in a beautiful little shop. The owner offered me room and board in addition to my wages. I had planned to save up for my own little cottage by the sea back home in Ireland. Just big enough for me to live in the back and have my own little shop in the front where I could make custom dresses and do alterations. Everything I needed would be in one place. That is, of course, until I met the man I would marry, then I would live with him and use the cottage just for my business, which would obviously need more room by then. I thought I had it all figured out. After the wreck changed everything, I knew no one would want my sewing or my hand in marriage, not after the things I'd done. Which I assume is why you're here. You wanted to meet Bonnie the Butcher. Well, I'm afraid you might be disappointed. No, I wanted to meet Bonnie Byrne because I think I might be the only person alive who knows that she's not a butcher. My grandfather was a very diligent man. He documented everything until nearly the moment of his death. But I didn't know how the story ends. Because as you know, my grandfather died two days before rescue. Judging by what he said, you are not what people think you are. And I think the truth deserves to be told. It's a miracle you made it out alive. There are very few truly miraculous things in this world, Miss Sullivan. I made it out alive because somebody had to. I'll tell you my story. But you have to promise to keep my new name, where I live, and what I do, out of it. Are we clear? Yes, of course. All right, then. We left Southern Ireland on a course for England on the 15th of June. The Lady Claire was a small passenger ship. Only ten of us were on board, plus the captain and a small crew. It was already hot and balmy on land, but on the sea, the weather was downright mild. The cool breeze kept us comfortable, but soon enough, 
that very breeze would betray us all. The trip was supposed to only take four to five days, but after the third day, a treacherous storm rolled in and the ship was blown way off course. The worst part of the storm came for us at night. Those of us who weren't pitched from the Lady Claire into the sea held on for dear life. Eventually, the boat was righted, and though we'd lost our sails, we were certain we couldn't be too far from land. When the sun rose, we saw that the ship was all but decimated. The air had gone still, and a dense fog had rolled in. There was no sign of land in sight. It appeared that the storm had carried us out of the Irish Sea and into open water, which would make a quick rescue less likely. But we held out hope. Among the people still on the ship were the captain, three crewmates, and seven passengers. Three of the passengers were women, including me, and four were men. The women stuck together, of course, we always do. At well, first, we helped ration the tiny bit of food and water that remained and tried to tend to the injured as best as we could. After four days adrift, all the food and drinkable liquid was gone and panic began to set in. Four days after that, when we still hadn't been rescued, panic began to set in. The captain told us to hold fast. When the fog cleared, and it had to eventually, we would be saved. We just had to stay strong. But the crew wasn't convinced. On the sixth day, without food or water, still mired in a dense fog, the captain told us to offer up every scrap of clothing we didn't need to preserve our modesty, and then sent the crew to recover all the wood that wasn't necessary to keep the ship afloat. A few tools remained after the storm, and miraculously, so did my sewing kit. So we would construct some kind of mast and a makeshift sail. The women were, of course, on sewing duty, but we had a problem. All of our trunks had been lost in the wreck, and the clothing we did have didn't seem to be enough. Even with everyone down to their under things, it still wasn't enough fabric. But the captain told us to stay strong. Once the wind returned and the fog cleared, we could make our way back toward land with what we had. The makeshift mask went up quicker than we thought, but by the seventh day without food or water, when we hadn't enough material or wind to set the boat in motion, the crew developed a different plan. They told the captain that some of the passengers should be killed. We could survive by eating their flesh and adding their skins to the sail. A bigger sail could surely catch a breeze, even if we couldn't feel it. The captain wouldn't have it. That was inhuman, even in our current situation. He said they had gone too far, but the wild-eyed crew was determined and they overtook the captain by force. They threw him into his cabin and nailed the door shut. Then they went to work. One by one, they killed the passengers, gutting them like fish and skinning their bodies. More dead meant more food and a bigger sail. The other women went first, of course. I was only kept alive because I was a seamstress and they needed someone to fashion the sail. It was gruesome work, bloody and foul. Did you eat anything? I took what they gave me. If I hadn't, I'd be dead. On day 13 of the desperate times, as we would come to call them, we hoisted the sail. It was a horrible sight to behold. Bits of shirts and pants and large swaths of ragged, bloody skin all sewn together. The captain, who could see out from the tiny porthole in his cabin, began screaming. The crew had been feeding him through a little slat they cut in his cabin door. They kept him alive because they knew that killing the captain was the greatest crime a sailor could commit. And 
It was only he who could report the conditions we suffered that necessitated the atrocities the crew had committed. Without the captain, it was every man for himself. And some of them, even if they survived, would surely be executed. The crew tried to calm the captain, who had begun banging on the cabin door with all of his might, but it didn't work. Eventually, the noise abruptly stopped, and the captain stopped responding. Frightened by the silence, the crew pried open his door. They thought he had been banging on the door with his fists, but from the look of him, it had been his head. Eventually, his neck gave way, which killed him. With no one to be accountable for the events that happened on the Lady Claire, the crew knew someone was destined to answer for the carnage, and so they all turned on each other. They fought with their blades and hammers, which even in the winter caused injuries too great to overcome. Within 24 hours, all three crew members were dead, and I, who had crawled into the captain's cabin, was alone. I laid the captain out in a dignified manner and pushed the bodies of the crew off the deck. I had little interest in violence or survival at that point. The next morning, a cool breeze blew once again, and the fog lifted. I ran up on deck to look at the sunshine, only to discover that I could easily see land. We were still in the Irish Sea, as it turned out not a mile from our destination. The fog and our disorientation prevented us from realizing that we hadn't gone that far. I could have swam ashore at any time. The gentle wind then filled that horrific sail and slowly blew me to shore. By the time I arrived, a crowd had gathered. Reporters said I had staggered off the ship nearly naked and covered in blood with bits of skin in my hair. But that's where the truth ended. I wasn't carrying a giant blade or the captain's severed head. They tried to throw me in jail, but there was nothing but my word remaining. And though the public didn't want to believe me, the law had to. You see, I wasn't a member of the crew, so even if you choose to believe the worst of me, my actions weren't mutinous. But none of that mattered. The image of me on that horrifying boat staggering onto dry land, skeletally thin and bathed in blood, was something no one would ever forget. And who could blame them? Stories began to circulate that I masterminded all the killings and dismemberment. That I had manipulated the crew, then killed them off one by one. There was no stopping the talk once it began. Eventually, I was able to move to America under a different identity, and that's where I stayed. I cut my hair, got rid of my accent, and became Anna Parker. The legend of Bonnie the Butcher, Cannibal Queen, and Taylor of Terror is just that. A legend. Anna... I'm so sorry. You went through all of that. And for nothing. Not for nothing. It taught me a lot about the true nature of men. And what it takes to survive. I can't imagine what it was like to see that you had been so close to shore all along. Thank you. For finally sharing the truth. Well, it's the truth according to me. I've stuck to the same story since the day I walked off that boat. But there's no way to confirm that my version is true, is there? Your grandfather saw very little of what actually happened. He simply wrote down what he heard and saw through his tiny window and a hole in his cabin door. Which wasn't much. That's true. But I believe you. Why would you make all of that up? You were a young seamstress, not a cold-blooded killer. <laughs> One can be both, Emily. If they have to be. That's the thing about legends. Eventually, no one is able to separate fact from fiction. 
not even the people who were there. Oh. Well, I've taken up enough of your time. Yes. I do hope you'll come back and see me again sometime, though. You didn't even get to look around my shop. I make some lovely garments out of a very unique sort of leather. What kind of leather? Now that's my secret, isn't it? You take care now, Emily. Keep your eyes open and the wind at your back. I will. Goodbye, Anna. Goodbye, Emily. <laughs> I'm Holly. I'm Leslie. And we, we would be dead. Hey, Holly. Hey, Fiends. It's our St. Patrick's Day episode. <laughs> Irish air horns. Yes. They sounded Irish to me. I like them. <laughs> <laughs> it's our most important best day of the year. I know. Why do we care so much I about this holiday? I mean, we really do, though. <laughs> you guys, get ready. We're and so excited. This is our fourth St. Patrick's Day episode. Shut it. I know. Isn't that crazy? What? Why did it not feel like big when it was Valentine's Day? We're like, whatever. We're, yeah, it's whatever. Valentine's Day. Love it's, our, it's our anniversary. We did nothing yeah. at all. You no, know, but we're like, nothing. four years of St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But you know what? It's exciting and we like it. So, And each episode, each year is more exciting than the next, if you ask me. For sure. For it's sure. Keep getting better. But all that enthusiasm and Irish celebrating can be, you know, it can be kind of exhausting. Yeah, draining. Kind of totally draining. It leaves the leaves dark circles under mm -hmm. my eyes. I'm pale and puffy. Yep. Somehow I'm both pale and puffy. Oh man. I know they don't both happen a lot. Oh. So sometimes my skin is also dry. It's Ugh. just the worst combination. Sounds miserable. It's bad. And I've tried every remedy known to humankind to get my skin back to a nice, healthy pot of gold glow. Every remedy? Well, you know what? So far, none of them have worked. But mm. I do remember hearing the legend of one magical mm. ingredient that might just do the trick. Okay. Just a little pinch of validation. Here we're dying on. Is that like a little leprechaun saying it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's cute. I'm glad they're here <laughs> for this episode. They're here. They're here. They're uh, they're ready to go. I'm so glad. And you know what, Leslie? What? Our fiends can give us that priceless ingredient totally free of charge. Shut the front door. How? But how, you must be asking yourself. Yes. I and know. so is the leprechaun. Aw. Well, I got to tell her. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you both. Okay. <laughs> Simply head on over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star rating and or a friendly review. It really is the only way to move this podcast forward. Ratings and reviews equal attention. Attention equals support. And support equals more and better content for all of you. Well, that sounds real nice, Holly. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Leprechaun, <laughs> stay over there. I'm so glad you're excited, Leprechaun. Yeah, we're in this is a great time. Oh, my gosh. Kind of a over Midwestern Leprechaun. Well, well he's yeah, a real great time. Pack of smokes. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting better and better. Yeah, you know. Can't wait to hear where they go during this episode. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what, you guys? If you're going to leave us a bad review, at least make it a creative one. Sure. Two dumb twats. Two dumb twats. Two dumb twats. Oh, oh leprechaun. leprechaun. It's three dumb twats now. Oh, man. Oh, two and a half dumb twats. <gasps> that's our sitcom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's our t-shirt. That's happening. Two and a half dumb twats. <laughs> Just a random leprechaun on there. <laughs> With a leprechaun. <laughs> Stop it. I mean, we already have our toast shirts. Yeah. Oh, we should be selling those right now. <laughs> we should be. Why isn't there a leprechaun? We on are selling them. Oh, they're right. You can now. buy them right now. Yeah. They're on our site. I mean, we're we're in the go buy them. Talking about the future right now. So 
We have merch. We yeah. just don't promote it. We got it. We're doing it now. We have shirts um, mm-hmm. that are St. Patrick's Day inspired sure. and they are green and gold and they say toast on them. Yeah. You know, because we toast yeah. and it's a good time to toast when it's St. Patrick's Day. So if you guys want one of those, you want to look like a team member, you can purchase your mm-hmm. own. I think they're some of our best work. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. But if you just can't wait for more, we would be dead in your life and merch isn't enough. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. You don't have to wait. And you can have more. Okay. You can support us over on Patreon. Thank you, Leprechaun. Oh, he's taking my job. Just for this week. There, for just a few dollars a month, you will gain access to our entire catalog of 30-minute horror movies. Uh, And we did Leprechaun. We did, yeah. Which I believe was one of our best. Yeah. We were continually shocked at Jennifer Aniston. I know. It was great. I, that, that's what made it good. We were I, like, oh, this is. isn't a bad movie. None of them were really bad. No. I mean, the, the people in Leprechaun, some of the movies we did were yes. extremely bad. Yes, yes, yes. I was going to say. I don't think I've ever seen anything worse than Thanks Killing 3. Yeah. No, not even the Jesus one. Which one was that again? Th- oh, uh, Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter. I or still, that was lower budget, but I think Thanks Killing 3 was worse. What do you think? Yeah. I don't know. You guys, you can tell us what you they think were. if you're a patron. Yeah. I had a hard time. Oh, that, okay. I had a hard time staying on like understanding the Jesus one, like that one I could not take notes for. And then you had a hard time taking the notes for the Thanksgiving one. I tapped right? out during Thanksgiving yeah. three at mm-hmm. one point. I was like, can you had watched it already? I think oh, you yeah. were like, oh, I watched it first. And I sat there going like, I can't. <laughs> it's so good. I had to watch it. I know you were like, I love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I really like where they went with the Muppet. I, right up somebody's <laughs> ass, which is where they went, I believe. Um, You need to be on like, I think a heroic dose of mushrooms for that movie to yeah. be any kind of sense. Sure. And you guys can find out more if you join us over on Patreon. Yeah, does that sound it. weird and you don't yeah. know what's going on? You should be a patron. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you will also get access to some special mini-sodes, our weekly after show, Host Mortem, which is available in both video and audio formats. Maybe you want to see our faces. Maybe you don't. Both are okay. You also get to join our uh, true crime documentary mm-hmm. club. Mm-hmm which is what we're calling it now. Mm -hmm. Let's talk docs. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this month we are talking about, oh, what was it called again? And I picked it. Um, Something like I have a secret. Let me tell you a secret. I want, I have a secret. I want (laughs) Um, to tell you a secret. Can I tell you a secret? None of the ones we said. Great. (laughs) (laughs) It's a a, a British documentary called Can I Tell You a Secret? Mm -hmm. It's based on a podcast of the same name. So if you really want to get into it, there is a multi-part podcast. Um, and it's a catfish story. Your favorite. I fucking love a catfish story. And this one is wild. It goes, it takes a lot of turns. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to all of our patrons about it. Okay. Because if you don't know what Let's Talk Doc is, Docs is, we get together um, via live stream and we all talk about the, the same documentary. Yeah. So it's fun. Um, and if you have a catfish experience, but bring that to the table with you because I want to hear it. Yeah. Maybe you were catfish. Maybe you were the catfish. Oh, no. I mean, I especially want to know yeah. if you were the catfish. <laughs> Maybe you just like catfish. Maybe you thought this was a fish and chips situation. Yeah. It's not. Fish and chips. Yeah. That's yeah. what I thought it was. Anyway, hmm. you'll also get a special gift in the mail from us if you're a patron. You'll get the opportunity to participate in some giveaways, some special merch deals, an on-air toast dedicated just to you, and more. Wow. More is great. Mm-hmm. In all honesty, we are here thanks to our patrons. So come on over and be part of the We Would Be Dead family. That sounds wonderful. <gasps> Leprechaun, you can be there. I'm looking over at the other chair next to you. Like you are every time. That, and it makes yeah. me really happy. Mm-hmm. Leslie doesn't like her. It's fine. <laughs> she created her. <laughs> just like here all the time. Just today. Just today. And if all of that is a little too much for you, not the Leprechaun, the other yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you can simply follow us on social media. We are at Would Be Dead Pod anywhere and everywhere you get your content. You can like our posts, share our posts, like and share our posts. Ooh. Yeah, that's the best one. Or leave us a comment, post about your favorite episode, let us know when you're listening. Tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell your little shady neighborhood leprechaun friend. Oh. What's their name? Trixty. Oh. Trixty. Trixty over here. <laughs> I and like Trixie. Her mother thought she was going to be a showgirl. Oh. But she turned out to be a leprechaun. Is she not? 
No. Well, she could be a, little... a showgirl leprechaun. We don't know. Yeah, she's a little bit of both. Oh, oh, yeah. oh. Then your friends and Trixie can become fiends and we can all hang out together. Oh, hey, girl. And you know you guys want that. Yeah. I mean, I want that. Yeah. We're good friends now. You've, you've We've worked it out. Yeah, perfect. during during your like little segment, we... That was yeah, quick. We worked it out. Quick and quiet. Yeah, I, I work fast. Well done. I have old grudges. Okay. <laughs> it's very nice of you. <laughs> and I think that's uh, all I have. Oh, no, no, no. I have one more announcement. Our St. Patty's Day uh, Campfire Stories yes. is occurring on actual St. Patrick's Day. Oh, yeah. Oh, Trixie. She'll be there. That's your day. <laughs> we love you. She will be there now. She we have no there, choice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that'll be, I believe, at nine o'clock we decided yep. on St. Patrick's Day. Um Eastern time. Yes, Eastern time. And it'll be fun. We're gonna tell some we're gonna play Irish true crime stories roulette. We'll tell you guys some stories. We'll have some fun times. Mm-hmm. If you have like a special St. Patrick's Day drink or a fun snack that you enjoy, please put that in our Facebook board and mm-hmm. we'll probably make it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, make sure you join us live for that on St. Patrick's Day. We can all celebrate and have a nice time together. Wonderful. Yeah, and keep your eyes on our socials. We will make sure that there are posts about that so that you don't forget. Sure. Or that I don't forget. I won't forget. It's fine. (laughs) (laughs) And now I think that is all I have in the way of like weird little announcements for this week. Leslie, do you have anything to add before we begin? I can't think of one thing. Not a thing. No. Got them all. I went through... All my thoughts. Okay. And good. couldn't think of any. <laughs> I went through all my thoughts yeah. and there were none. There were none. There great, great, zero. great. <laughs> yeah. Rolodex was empty. All right, then. On with the show. On December 24th, 1835, so Christmas Eve. This is not a Christmas story, though. It's an Irish one, I promise. The Angarona, a stately sailing ship, was making its way from its home port in Newfoundland to the picturesque sailing village of Tainmouth in the English county of Devon. Tainmouth, once a rustic port, had, through the success of the Newfoundland cod industry, transitioned into a rather fashionable resort town Okay, in this uh, past 50 years mm-hmm. leading up to 1835. So it's, uh, it's like a nice little place to go on vacation. It still is, actually. It's still a beautiful little seaside town in England. Add it to the list. Exactly. We're going to Tainman. I love a cod. (laughs) Who doesn't? (laughs) Fish and chips. Yes. The Angarona is recorded to have been... Angarona. (laughs) That sounds like my Sharona's angry cousin. Yeah. This is my Sharona. This is my Angarona. (laughs) (laughs) Leprechaun Trixie. Oh my God, Trixie. Deep voice. Less whiskey. Were you at the Jameson Distillery? Did that man hit on you? (laughs) Well, you know. We're going to ignore that <laughs> sound. The Angarona, as I said, is recorded to have been a merchant vessel. And this means that it can transport goods or passengers or both. It was, and I cannot say this enough, not full of fishermen and old salts. Okay. But rather a slightly wealthier class of men. Mm-hmm. And they would have been all men at this point yeah. in time. Um, sometimes they had passengers of all kinds, but not on this particular voyage. So these were passengers or merchants looking to spend time in Tainmouth. The crew members and um, and several other members of another ship's crew, including their captain. Okay. So there's two captains on board? There are. Okay. Which sounds weird, right? And is that crew like more a crew? You know, I don't really know much about them. And here's why. As it so happens, while the Angarona was docked in St. John's, Canada, they picked up a few members of the crew of a ship called the Freedom, which had wrecked the previous week. This is important information. The two captains thing does come back later. Now, the Freedom wrecked and everybody on board like swam ashore or some shit and like made it. They like toughed it out and got to shore. So while I don't know much about like these guys' home life, they're they're pretty tough. (laughs) Okay. They're good swimmers. They're good. They're, yes, they're experienced seamen. Gotcha. Just like we like them. hmm Yep. I mean, seamen are always good swimmers. They are. For the most part. It's not always. No, anyway. well, let's not judge any of them. <laughs> I will. They are salty, though. What? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Huh. 
Through freezing weather and stormy seas, Captain John Jellard guided the sprawling Angorona towards its destination with laser focus. But that morning, something else caught his attention. Hmm. I know. Off in the distance, he saw a ship that had been demasted. Oh. I know. Yikes. Sounds awful, right? Mm -hmm. And it is. It's not great. This means the masts, which are the major, like, big old posts that hold Mm -hmm. up all the sails and the rigging in the ship, had been broken off. Okay. Likely during a wreck. Wrecks are not uncommon during this time. I should say that, like, they don't have a lot of precautions or ways to navigate that are beyond kind of primitive things. So ships did did wreck. They did. The stuff I'm going to tell you about soon is not common whatsoever. Mm. <laughs> but wrecks okay. did happen. Usually people got rescued. Okay. Anyway, but the ship had been righted, obviously. Like, it, it looked like it went through something and then it popped back up, I guess. Mm-hmm. And from what he could see, it seemed like there were still crew members on board this ship. Okay. The captain wasn't sure, but he thought he could see men waving from the deck. Hmm. Ever the brave and dutiful man, Captain Jellard announced his findings to the other men on the ship. So he's like, oh my God, shipwreck. Right. Yeah. Off the port bow or whatever. You know. The, ship talk. Yeah, they were doing some ship talk. The wind was howling and the seas were treacherously rough, but Captain Jellard wanted to veer off course and attempt a rescue mission. Okay. A brave sailor indeed. The Angorona had a rowboat too, and with the help of a few other men, they could get close enough to the ship, then board the rowboat and go over to it and like get on Mm -hmm. and rescue people. Most of the men on board the Angorona thought this was kind of an insane suicide mission. And I would have to agree, it was freezing, the seas are rough. You're in a little wooden rowboat. But a few of them did agree that any lives still aboard this demasted ship were worth saving. Okay. That's nice. nice. Yeah. Snowball. Crucially, among the guys who agreed to go on the rescue mission or be involved in it was the second captain. Okay. The captain of the Freedom, who would be able to take the wheel of the Angorona and deftly keep it close enough to the other ship that this would all be possible. Mm. So if there wasn't a second guy that could drive this ship, What's about to happen never would have been able to be accomplished, really. Gotcha. So they're like, all right, we're going to do it. As the Angorona got closer, they lower the rowboat. The captain of the Angorona and the other guys are going towards it. But the other captain can see the men on deck, right? He's up high, so he can see them. Mm-hmm. And they're furiously waving. We established that. Some are waving their hands. And others seem to be waving strange foreign objects. So I, he can't really tell what they are. Some are long, some are short. They're all kind of mobile. And these men are screaming for their lives. Okay. Captain Jellard and his four brave mates down on the water level, not seeing this, row the tiny boat through the furious wind while this is all happening. And when they get close enough, the captain of the Freedom notices that what they are waving is not just their own arms, but the foul and bloody dismembered arms and legs of, I suppose, other crew members. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. And there's no way the captain on the Angorona can warn the rescue mission. Like, sure? they're waving legs. Right. So yeah. he's like, oh, God. What's going to happen? Right. So nobody knows. This is like an exciting moment right sure, now. Sure, sure. I'm terrified. Excited. I know, right? I just can't imagine. So Captain Jellard and his four brave mates rowed the tiny boat. They get up, they, they board the ship. And when they get there, the Cap- Captain Jellard recalls the deck of this vessel looking like what he called, quote, a, a butcher shop Oof. for humans with arms and legs and torsos hung out all over the place. Some had clearly been stripped of their flesh. The ship itself was bare and in disarray. There was a makeshift platform had been, that had been constructed where men could sit and sleep to avoid the freezing water the ship had taken on. Oh, man. Yeah, no cargo or supplies were anywhere in sight, and the captain had gone to his cabin to prepare for rescue. Now, the men aboard this ship, the ones that were waving arms and legs, were wild-eyed, emaciated, and desperate. They greeted their rescuers with rasping voices and ragged faces ravaged with frostbite, Weeping with gratitude, though they lacked the hydration to even produce tears. They're like zombies at this point, basically. And they just wanted to be saved. And it became clear quickly that these were like, they they just wanted to be rescued. They didn't want to hurt anybody. Yeah. 
Because I, I feel like if I stepped on board that, I'd be like, oh, they're going to kill me. These right. people are 100% going to kill me. Right. But they, they were like, all right, no, we got to save It's them. wild that they even can trust that they're being saved too at this point. If they're That's that. a good point. Yeah. You're like, who knows what you are? You could yeah. be ghosts. Mm -hmm. Captain Jellard was by no means an inexperienced seafarer, but he had never seen anything like this in yeah. his whole life. I mean, who has? Uh, just him, I think. <laughs> he climbed through the skeletal survivors and body parts to make his way to the captain's quarters. And when he entered, he found the man himself with a bowl of human entrails beside him. Oh. Sinister. This captain told Captain Jellard that he was Captain Timothy Gorman, and he had just stepped aboard a ship called the Francis Spate. And due to the desperation of their situation, having been stranded for more than a fortnight with no food or water, the captain had made the decision to enact the custom of the sea. Eighteen men had boarded the ship, three were lost in the wreck, and 11 living remain. Wow. In that moment, that was all he had to say. Over the course of two trips back and forth, all 11 men were brought on board the Angorona where they were greeted by what I can only imagine were fucking stunned passengers. Yeah. Because, as I mentioned before, and for this very reason, they're not people who are like, oh, yeah, yeah, we've seen like some crazy shit. We understand that life is ridiculous. These are people that are like, probably upper middle class. They're merchants. They're like traveling. If you were going to like from Canada to Ireland or England, you had a lot of money back then. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I, I felt the need to tell you that. Yeah. Their reaction must have been absolutely insane. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, they could not have known what to do with the sight of these men, many of whom were, by the way, missing fingers or toes and parts of their ears and parts of their noses from frostbite. Their hot eyes are all sunken in. They weigh like nothing. They've been out there for like 20 some days so they have raggedy ass beards. Right. These are terrifying zombie men. Oh my gosh. Woo! I just can't even imagine. Mm -mm. And these the people on this other ship are like having their morning coffee. Right. <laughs> yeah, they're having their like high noon tea. Good morning. <laughs> this is a lovely Christmas Eve. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's Molly. It's Molly's ghost. <laughs> they all jump off. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> oh. The unflappable Captain Jellard, however, orders the men to be treated with, quote, brotherly kindness as they had endured the custom of the sea. And if you knew, you knew. You knew. Yep. <laughs> they were given borrowed clothes and rationed just broth and water because mm -hmm. they couldn't have even eaten at this point right, in time. Yeah, it would start slow. Exactly. It's like the refeeding process yeah. had to be very slow. So. The Angorona takes them on and they complete the journey they were on. They don't go to Tainmouth, they go to Falmouth. And I think that is because Falmouth is more of like a, an industrial port city and these mm. people stood more of a chance there. Okay. Tainmouth is more of like a little village. Gotcha. Um, so they arrive in, in Falmouth, England, on January 6th, 1836, which means this was like 15 days after they were rescued. Okay. So they, they took a long, it, wow. it was still a long journey. After they got to Falmouth, they're put up in a local workhouse or cared for by local families. People like, you know, hook them in and stuff. Mm -hmm. Workhouses, as we have talked about before, were not like really great places if you had to be there. Mm -hmm. But this was more of a we're going to help you out situation. And there's places to sleep and clothes and food there. Got you. What year is this again? 1836 now. Okay. Because it went from December to January. Right. So this is this is before the Ripper? I think so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't even remember anymore. <laughs> Lord. So once they're in Falmouth, they're cared for and they're given means to contact their loved ones. And I guess go home if they want it. I don't know if I'd ever want to get on another boat again. Right. I mean, you guys will find out what happened to these men soon enough. Oh my but gosh. I just, I know. yeah. And some of them didn't actually, which we'll get to. On January 8th, so a couple of days after they get there, Captain Timothy Gorman wrote to the real life Francis Spate, man who the ship was named after. Okay. Uh, and the letter, which with pieces redacted, was printed in the County Clare Journal the following week, read as follows. So I'm going to read you the first part of this article, and then we'll read the second part later. And this is the captain of that ship that they yes. rescued. The like Francis a... Spate, which okay. is who we're talking about the rest of the... This is the ship that, like, wrecked and everybody looks like zombies okay. on it. And um, they're, they're from Ireland, which mm -hmm. is why this is Irish. So gotcha. <laughs> we'll get there momentarily. Mm -hmm. So... Here is the letter from Captain Gorman. Falmouth, 8th of January, 1836. Oh, I guess I should do the Irish accent for this, right? Yeah. I do it every year. Dear sir, 
It is with the greatest reluctance that I can bring myself to tell you that your fine ship is lost, and which I am heartily sorry for. We left St. John's on the 25th November, and on the night of the 3rd of December, in latitude of 46 degrees north, longitude about 48 west, when lying to under a closed reefed mitzen topsail, no idea what that means, you guys, the ship upset and turned bottom up. On getting the masts cut away, she again righted, but every article on deck save the bare poop deck, (laughs) not leaving us, the remaining sufferers, 15 in number, the smallest particle of provisions or yet water. We were then left in that dreadful state such as Tong could not describe until the 22nd, when, not being able to endure the suffering any longer, Pat O'Brien, a boy, John Gorman, Cook, Michael Behane, and George Burns, apprentice, died. Ooh. Series of asterisks to not tell these people what this man had to say. And it says from the newspaper, here we withhold at the desire of Mr. Spate and out of respect for the feelings of the public, some shocking facts in connection with the dreadful occurrence. Back to the letter. On the afternoon of that day, we were taken off the wreck by the Angarona, Captain Jellard, bound from Newfoundland to Tainmouth and landed here this morning. Through Captain Jellard's kind attention, we were getting quite recovered, for we were in a most dreadful state when he took us off the wreck. This, sir, is a most dreadful account for you, but it cannot now be helped. I am, dear sir, your obedient servant, Timothy Gorman. Okay. That's just the letter, okay? All right, something terrible happened. That's all we know. People died. Falmouth was, of course, buzzing about what happened to these, like, haunted-looking men who are, like, wandering around the town looking real strange. And Mm -hmm. and according to every article I read, they're like, people could tell who they were. (laughs) Right. When they saw them, they're like, (gasps) One of, one of those guys. <laughs> exactly. You're one of them. Mm-hmm. And though I have been withholding for dramatic effect when it comes to the real story as of yet, perhaps the most shocking part of this whole ordeal is that the sailors were not. Okay. Yeah. The interviews that followed, both legal and for the benefit of the press, included a series of grim and shocking narratives. The story of the wreck of the Francis Spate began to unfold before the public. But once again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to where the story began. Great. The Francis Spate, built in 1834, was a transport ship owned by, as we mentioned, a local merchant named Francis Spate. Oh, nice. He just really likes his name, I think. Sure. I mean, you got to put your name on it. You would be like, that's my boat. It has my name on it. Yeah, he has other ships, and um, one of them is named after his house. So he's just like, hey, let's name it after. Not his wife, ever. No. You're supposed to name boat after women, I thought. You want it to be something like happy that you want to go. <laughs> your house and your and yourself. And yourself. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and this particular ship sailed from its home port in Limerick. Limerick is a city in Western Ireland in County Limerick. Oh. Because it seems like every city has its own county. Sure. It's great. And it is in the province of Munster. Which I wanted to be like the cheese. It is not. It's not. Depressing. Limerick was founded by Scandinavian settlers in 812. Very, very old. During the Viking Age. And you know, the Vikings followed Norse mythology and traditions, Mm -hmm. which I'm willing to bet added to the folklore of the region. Mm. And if you guys will remember, and I'm sure you do, word for word, our very first Christmas episode, the Norse were pretty big on little people of their own. Okay. Elves factor in pretty oh. greatly into their mythology, which are suspiciously similar to. Wait a minute. I think it's time for Leslie's Leprechaun Lessons. Today is your lucky day. Yeah. Oh, yes, it is. It is. <laughs> Did you guys think we were going to forget? <clears throat> Never. No. Did you think we were going to do this four years in a row? No. Never. No. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are, committed. <laughs> so, Leslie. Why don't you, uh, do you have a, a leprechaun lesson for us for today? Well, I do. Good old Trixie here. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Well, you know, I just had, to, I had a lesson for Leslie. Oh, my goodness. Thank I'm so Thank you glad. so much, Trixie. So I'm going to share with you um, a tale. Give it to us. Give us a tale. So this is the story of the Templemore miracle hoax. Ooh, a miracle Ooh, and a hoax? Uh, yeah. So much in this story. You picked a really full one. All right. 
So during the Irish War, and by the way, I'm just reading an article, but we're going to talk about it because I read a thousand of these articles, so I I know a lot about what's happening. And we would, we should say that Templemore and Limerick are 54 minutes apart. That's right. By modern car. But still, not that far, so we're in the same kind of place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like when that happens. I do too. Okay. During the Irish War of Independence, County Tipperary was a hotbed of activity. Ooh, a hotbed. Hotbed. The first shots of war rung out at Solo Headbag Ambush in January 1919, and the country preceded resistance fighters such as Sean Trieste and Dan Brown. I don't know, just some people in Ireland, right? The Irish guys are doing it. Yes, they're doing it. On August 16th, Royal Irish Constipulary, the RIC, District Inspector William Harding Wilson was shot by the <gasps> IRA in Templemore Town. We okay. hate that. Yeah. Well. Or we like that. I think we liked, I don't know. I'm, I get confused whose side I'm supposed to be on with these. It's not my war. You know, it's not my fight. The IRA was a, a kind of extreme situation. They, they, okay. And innocent people died. Sure. So, you know. Gotcha. Following the shooting crown, forces ran amok in the town and surrounding <gasps> area. A muck. They ran a muck. That night, 16-year-old James Walsh created a sensation when he proclaimed that he saw a vision of Our Lady or Mary, okay. right? Mary, Mother of Jesus. And that one, that's, that's the lady. one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and claimed that the holy statues in his home were crying tears of blood. Yeah. Right? According to Walsh, the apparition told him to dig a holy well in the floor of his cottage. Got to do it. Yeah, he did it, and it filled with water, and he had, like, water there. I don't know. Wow. There was just a, a well, a nice, fresh water. Right. Okay. Right. Um, fresh water, too, huh? Didn't I we? guess. Yeah, I guess they were drinking it. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> that could have been bad. <laughs> we're going to talk about drinking salt water later, so I'm <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Following Walsh's claim, Constable Thomas Whimsy of the— Whimsy! <laughs> That's a great name. I wish my last name was Whimsy. Of the Templemore RIC barracks came forth with his holy statue, which also cried tears of blood. And then do news- they all? Well, I don't one. have any. Do all holy statues cry no, tears of blood? No, but his did. Oh, lucky guy. News agent Thomas Dwan, uh, D W A N Dwan. Yeah, sounds right. Also had a bleeding statue. So now there's three bleeding statues. <laughs> people like, well, mm-hmm. I want one too. I know. Ugh. All these people, they had bleed. They were like, oh my God. Um, and what a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> so now everybody's just like, okay, look, all these bleeding statues are here. There is a well that was being told to be dug up. Because um, in this well, like filled with water that was like holy water. That's why it's a holy well. Oh, and course. it helped cure like ailments and stuff. So the whole town was just like, oh, my gosh, this is like like um, they protected our town from this like craziness that was going on because nobody in the town. So after this guy was killed and like the British soldiers came in and like ran amok. Right. Oh, nobody, mock. nobody in the town, like none of the innocent people or yeah. even other soldiers were killed. Like there wasn't, oh. nobody died. Nobody got hurt. Okay. It was well, just but like, like property got damaged that's and well. looting occurred, but no one got physically hurt. Well, that's good. So when these statues started like bleeding tears, it was kind of like, like God and mother Mary is just like, like, oh, like so sad about what's going on. But like, I'm here to protect you guys. Oh, it's no. like, that's what people are feeling. Right. That, yeah. All right. Sure. So the stunning sight of the bleeding statues drew crowds to Tipperary to witness the Templemore miracles for themselves. Thousands made the pilgrimage to Templemore and Walsh's cottage where the holy well was said to cure ailments. A makeshift altar was erected in the yard of Dwan's news agent's store where the statues were on display. And special trains were put on to carry pilgrims from all corners of Ireland to uh, Templemore. Are these Catholics? Catholics love their liquids. They do. They love their liquids. They Saints love like a story. And water yeah, coming from like, a wall oh gosh, and shit. They love like, that shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as pilgrims poured into Templemore, the presence of the British rule slipped away. In a letter to the IRA headquarters in Dublin Tipperary Brigade, Vice Commandant Edward McGrath wrote, The police and military have disappeared off the streets and the IRA have taken over. They control the traffic, introduced parking, and restored order. I mean, parking is great. Yeah, sure. We like the parking situation. Hey, when there's no parking. Many in the IRA were skeptical of the miracles. 
and Michael Collins called on Dan Breen. This was one of the guys I was like, I don't know who, who this is, to bring Jim Walsh to Dublin to be questioned. So I also, I was like, I guess Michael Collins is somebody. Yes, he is. Um, <laughs> I know this. <laughs> Do you? No, I, I Yeah, I have it right here. <laughs> because um, because I was talking about this article before. I was yeah. like, I don't know. And I was you like, looked uh, it up. <laughs> he's kind of a big deal. Um. It doesn't say right away. Isn't he Michael like Collins prime minister was an or Irish revolutionary soldier and politician who was a leading figure in early 20th, early 20th century struggle for Irish independence. He has a title, though. It's a big deal. He's a leader. Um, he's a big deal. Because, like, when I looked it up, it was just a man, like, recently that died, like an older man. And no, I was like, nope, that's no, not he's him. like a big deal. I don't know Irish history really well, but he's a, what's his title? Hold on. Uh, minister of the self-declared Irish Republic. That's right. Minister. Yeah. So yeah. he's like a he's big... He's like a minister of magic. Yeah, and... he works in the Ministry of Magic. Okay. He's a government official. He's a big Clearly deal. important. Yeah. And I was just like, I don't know who this guy is, but his name's everywhere. I mean, like, Michael article. Collins? He's some dude. <laughs> he must be somebody. Um, And he's good looking, too. Isn't he, he is very handsome. Yeah. Okay. Angry, stern in all pictures, sure. but well, handsome. he's mad because he's like, there's like people are running amok. There's a hoax happening. I need to prove this. I got to cross right? my arms and glare at you. Yeah. So he is not buying this like bleeding statues thing. He's just like this 16 year old kid is like spewing right, some kid. bullshit. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so they bring so they bring Jim Walsh into Dublin to be questioned. Jim Walsh again, again, is a 16 year old boy. After the interview, Collins was convinced Walsh was not to be trusted and the young man was sent back to Tipperary, which means that he was like, no, my statues are bleeding blood. Like he like held it. He's like, this is happening. Hell yeah. And if you've ever talked to a teenager, no matter what, after that conversation, you are frustrated. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he <laughs> was probably so unaffected too. Oh, sure. He was just like, he was just like, yeah, uh, she was bleeding blood. She's tears of blood. I went downstairs. She's like, there's no bleeding. way. What happened? You won't be in trouble. Tell me the truth. There's just there's tears of blood. I yeah. don't know. You saw Dug it. a hole. Now everybody's cured. You don't, you want to get rid of the well? You want to be the guy that made yeah. everybody hate everything? Yeah. You want to be the guy that ruins all their good times? Fine. Yeah. I just did what I was told, man. Just like, no, you did this. <laughs> I can see it now. Mm -hmm. Frustrating. Oh, yeah. So, the IRA action in Tipperary had ceased since the Temple Moor miracles, and this annoyed Collins, because he's just annoyed all around, who wanted activities to resume. <laughs> Up until then... He is that guy. Yeah. Like, Stop it! <laughs> Stop <laughs> believing in things! <laughs> Up until then, Tipperary had been a strong outpost in the Republicans' fight against the Crown, and Collins wanted that pressure to keep going. So, on his orders, action resumed on the 29th of September when the IRA ambushed a party of the IRC men at Golding's Cross. Two IRC men were killed in the ambush, and later that night, Crown forces looted and burned homes around Templemore. So it all happened again. Uh, they ran well, because that's they got rid of the statues. Again. The so-called miracles had not cured the violence and by daybreak, the uh, stall holders and hawkers who had swamped Templemore disappeared and so did, uh, so did too, like all the pilgrims. So uh, a muck was ran. <laughs> <laughs> and We've run all the way yeah. through a muck. And there were no more crying statues and they realized like, okay, like there, if there was something um, protecting this town, it no longer is. So because we're out of fucked here. It up. We're out, we're out of here. Good job, Michael Collins. Michael Collins had asked for one of the bleeding statues to be sent to him in Dublin because he just would not let this. No, he's like a triple asshole. He's like, give me him. Yeah. I want to see. Yeah. And uh, one day a courier from the Tipperary arrived at his office with one. Collins studied it closely and gave it a tap off the side of his desk. He put it to his ear and heard a tick tock sound <gasps> inside. Oh, no, it's Ooh. a bomb. To the shock of those present, Collins then smashed the <gasps> holy statue and out fell a homemade alarm clock connected to a fountain oh. pen full of pig's blood. <laughs> when the clock struck a certain time, the fountain pen of blood would spurt out through the pinholes of the statue's eyes and mouth. Is that wild? Okay, it's let me such just a say. Good idea. Yeah, if my kid works that all the way out, I'd be like, yeah. I'm not even mad. I know. Way to go. Way to go, Jim. <laughs> Everybody had hope. Can you? The most unbelievable part is a teenager named Jim. Yeah. As for the teenager who started the whole thing, uh, James or Jim Walsh 
left for Australia in 1923 and never returned. He died in Sydney in 1977. With the horse thieves. Yeah. <laughs> and didn't, um, what year did uh, Michael Collins die? Wasn't it like 1923? Right, it was like right afterwards. Uh, yeah, he did not yeah. live much longer. Let me see, because he was cursed. Yeah. yeah um, 1922. Yeah, so he just... Right had, away. Yeah. <laughs> and then James was just like, my work here is done. And like, left see? For Australia. <laughs> see? If you guys had just left it alone, you'd probably mm-hmm. still be alive. Yeah. I don't know. What, I wonder how he died. <laughs> I could be saying something really awful right now. Out of frustration. He died, he out died of-, of frustration. Yeah. That's what it says right here. <laughs> no. You heard oh. it first. Oh, no. I think he died an awful way. Ew. Yeah, he got... A neck wound in an ambush. Ooh. And then they had to like transport him back to where they were going. It occurred and it resumed that they were going to Cork and he was like in a long stretch of road where there was nowhere for him to go. And like by the time he got to where he was going, I guess he just slowly oh, man. died. So it's kind of like karma because he kept yeah, like man. causing ambushes. He, he bled out too, like those bleeding eye statues. Oh, there, you go. <gasps> there you go. I mean, talk about supernatural intervention but listen here's what the stories don't tell you so you heard it here first yeah you're hearing it here first people um i got this from trick steve thank god yeah so james walsh you know never was never proven guilty of this right he he stayed claim that he was innocent he didn't do this right okay right um that to his knowledge they were bleeding statues that that's what was going on he just had And and the statue that Michael Collins got was not necessarily the one that was that was um James or Jim's. It was just one of the statues. Sure. So who knows? The other ones could have been real. This one could have been like a, a fake one. Somebody just wanted to get in on the action. Yeah. But if they were all fake anyway, um, the thing is is that it wasn't James's fault. He no. didn't know. No. It was a leprechaun that created the whole hoax bringing these in you know he really should have just said that because he didn't know the irish are pretty like i mean he could have he could have just been like i think it's a leprechaun's they don't, work they here. don't fuck with fairy folk there no and they're just like this is a tricksty thing that's happening this is the fae and they would have been like <gasps> yeah but um but yeah so it probably wasn't his fault i think it was a little leprechaun that came in and was be. trying to I cause mean, some, some trouble the guy that busted him did bleed to death there you go so that's some real some real karmic that's all we're saying karmic magical shit so um the moral of the story is um uh, i don't know if you're a teenager blame your shit on leprechauns yeah and yeah. uh and and don't try and ruin everybody's good time you fucking killjoy yeah for sure you're gonna bleed to death yeah yeah so okay and that is Leslie's Leprechaun Lessons. Today was your lucky day. Woo! Love it. That was a good lesson. Thank I you. feel like we could all learn a lot from that one. It was good. Mm. Thank you, Trixie. You're welcome, Leslie. Oh, oh my goodness. Gosh. Mm. All right, Is there pictures crying. of that one? Should we look for that or no? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Ooh. I'll put, I'll put pictures in. Okay, cool. I want to see these statues desperately. Yep. I don't know. I don't. Well, I'll see. Yeah. I wonder if they'll have like blood stains on them. That would be great. I want that. Yeah. Even if not, I want to see what these statues that but he there's like, rigs there's look always like. these cute little kids like in front of the the makeshift altar, just like praying in front of these statues. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. See the other that Michael Collins ruined all of their good times. Good time. They were just being. They were just having faith, mm-hmm. trying to believe in something, and like war ravaged home, and they just. <laughs> he was like no. Yeah, and it was like thousands of people came to this town. That's tourism to your town. I know. It was like 15, it was like something like 15,000 people well, visited for this. Don't ruin everything and the leprechauns won't get you. Just, yeah. I'm just saying. Okay. So back to the Francis Spate. Sure. Big ship. Looks like a pirate ship. I should just say to everyone who doesn't know anything about boats, which I don't really know much. But if you're trying to picture what kind of boat it is, it looks like a pirate ship, essentially. Okay. White sails, not the black ones. Okay. But, you know, it is large and impressive. And it was... um the local new- newspaper, nude papers, mm-hmm. all right. The local newspapers called it, quote, the grandest ship Limerick had ever seen. Okay. So it was a big deal. It was 108 foot long, 368 tons, and had two decks and three masts. Wow, fancy. It was a big, big guy, big boy. It was designed to haul immigrants from Ireland to Canada and timber from Canada to Ireland. Double duty. Yeah, we'll get more into that later. Okay. 
And the timber was then used to build even more ships. So timber was like a big commodity back then because mm -hmm. everybody needed boats for everything. Um, and at this point, it had been on just one journey since it was built and launched. And um, according to everybody who talked about it, this journey was very successful. Actually, like most of the passengers on it who were people that were taken from Limerick to Canada uh, got really sick and died or were quarantined and then died in quarantine. But we don't talk about that. So, you know, it's fine. But the second trip, the one we're talking about, not quite as successful. Not even as successful as people dying in quarantine. It's worse mm -hmm. than that. So, okay, yeah. So on September 13th, 1835, the Francis Spate left Limerick and sailed for 43 days before arriving in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada on October 25th. The crew, which included Captain Timothy Gorman and 17 able-bodied men, the youngest of whom was 15-year-old cabin boy Patrick O'Brien. Ooh, okay. Cabin boy. They all did the first leg of the journey. And then what would happen is because like you have to sail for such long periods of time, they would be on shore leave for a month. So mm -hmm. you like sail for two months, off for a month, get back on the boat. That's okay. how it works. So then they were in St. John, uh, not the beautiful island. Okay. <laughs> not the tropical island. I don't know about the St. John. Maybe it's also beautiful. Sure. In Canada. Very cold. So they're there. Um, and I should mention... This kind of work is very, 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 very physical. You're hauling like big pieces of wood and like, you know, the rigging on a boat. And like, it's not a job that you could be like a weak dude for. Okay. These are like big burly men, except for Patrick O'Brien. Oh, was, no. He was like, I clean and attend to well, the he's captain. Like 15, exactly. Right? Okay. And this was his first voyage ever. So um, he wasn't hauling any logs. He was also the son of a widow and had little to no family to speak of. And everybody said he was like a little bit whiny. Okay. That's fine. He was 15. Sure. And mad that he didn't think of blood crying statues. Yeah. So the crew takes their shore leave for a month while they're in St. John. They load up a shit ton of timber onto this onto the Francis Spade, like more than you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. The timber's supposed to be in like the cargo hold of the boat and like strapped down in other places. But Francis Spade really wanted a lot of timber. So he instructed his crew to pile it up on the deck too. Mm. Ships are like a weight, thing, like a balanced thing, just to yeah. put that into everybody's consciousness. Like you need to have your ship weighted a certain way for it to stay upright mm -hmm. in all conditions. Put that in your brain pocket. There you go. They also, while they're in Canada, pick up a passenger, just one. His name is John Palmer. Oh. And he would have had to have had a little money because he had to pay yeah. his way, not a crewmate. And he um, was just wanted to go to Ireland. He wanted to see Europe. Oh, nice. Yeah. He was like, I'm going to see a lot. <laughs> he did. Oh, no. Yeah, it's not great. On November 24th, having loaded up all the timber and the crew and John Palmer, uh, they returned to their posts on the Francis Spate and set sail for Limerick. But just nine days into their journey, a disaster would occur. Oh, boy. I know. At 3 a.m. on December 3rd, ooh, three and three. Mm -hmm. It's an unlucky time. It's the witching hour already. 12-3. One plus two is three. <gasps> oh, no. I didn't realize that until right now. Oof. This is a cursed moment. Sure. Oh, God. Okay, at this cursed moment, a howling storm hit. It is rain snowing, that horrible, like, yeah. sleety, freezy rain. The wind is blowing at an astronomical rate. The seas have been kicked off. They're super rough. It's sloshing over the deck of the ship. The boat is being pitched to and fro. It's a sailboat, so the wind yeah. is a huge thing, too. I mean, obviously the sails would be down, but still. And with all that wood up on the top deck, it couldn't properly navigate this kind of situation. Mm. The boat couldn't turn to avoid things. It couldn't go off course. And so soon enough, it fell on its side, damaging both masts beyond repair. There's three masts, but two of them were broken. I think the third must have been smaller or something. Three men were lost in the crash, so two of them fell into the sea. One was trapped in a cabin and then fell into the sea. Oh. Yeah, that's really rough. And the rest of the men were clinging to the rigging, so the ropes that hold the sails, they were just holding on by the ropes. While the captain and uh, one of his mates, the strongest one I guess he picked out, climbed the masts and cut them down. Okay. This is, this can't possibly be easy. These are like huge thick poles mm -hmm. that are supporting all of the sails and the rigging and stuff. So this mm -hmm. is not like a done. These are like fucking strong men to be doing right. that. 
But once the masts are cut away and they fall off, the weight evens on the boat and the boat writes itself. Right. Because all the wood falls off too. Yeah, yeah. So the remaining crew and their Canadian passenger then tumble back into the waterlogged deck. So they're like, blah, 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 they all fall back yeah, on the deck. Yeah, yeah. All their supplies have been lost. Ugh. When you capsize, everything just kind of yeah. like falls over. Although it's emptying a purse. Kind of, but like there are cabins and there's like a cargo. Yeah, it's wild that everything got lost. I know. I have a lot of questions. Okay. So the only thing that they maintained were three bottles of wine. Sure. Right. Isn't that pat- they were probably holding. <laughs> they were like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> just like desperately yeah, hanging on yeah. to them. Yeah. And the ship had taken on a substantial amount of water. Obviously, it was sideways. So, mm-hmm. And throughout the night, water was just pouring in from all angles from the waves that were crashing over the decks. Remember, this ship is tall, too. Yeah. So for the waves to be crashing over the top deck, they're big. Oof. Oh, that's so scary. I have, like, I have nightmares about waves. Well, this was, yeah. this was nightmarish. And so the crew, all they could do was gather in the captain's cabin, all of them together, ankle deep in water, and wait for the sun to rise. So according to accounts from these men that, I mean, all of them basically spoke afterwards, they were like up against the walls, holding yeah. on to each other to try and be as out of the water as they could be. Uh-huh. Because the water's freezing. It's not yeah. going to do well for you if you're wet. Sure. So the sun comes up and they think, okay, this is terrible, but we're on a very well-traveled route. Yeah. Somebody's going to pick us up pretty quick. Right. And because they don't have the mass anymore, they're just stuck there. Yeah. They can't keep going. Yeah. They're totally out of luck. Yeah. But they say, and I guess they don't have a rowboat or it fell off or whatever, but they have no means of travel. And they're nine days into the sea. Yeah. So it's not like they're a little way away. Sure. So they're like, okay, we just have to hold, hang tight for like a day, maybe two. It's going to suck, but they're going to get us. Mm -hmm. And ships did pass by. They just didn't see them. Oh, no. Or they chose not to see them. They're like, never mind. La, la, la. Nobody picked them up. Or like maybe they just didn't see, think anything was wrong. Or maybe they thought nobody was on board. You see a ship with the masts snapped off, set adrift. If you don't see men waving limbs on the deck, you probably think that's a wreck. There's nobody on it. Or maybe they weren't, like, equipped for, like, rescue. Yeah, it could have been a lot of things, but several ships passed them by. They were just nervous. They were like, oh, that looks scary. I mean, it did look scary. (laughs) Yeah. And it's not just one ship. It's not just two. It's, like, three of them. So that's that's pretty disheartening. Yeah. For three days, the guys on the Francis Spate neither slept nor sat down. Because remember, there's puddles. It's Uh not puddles. It's just water. It's like standing in a shallow pool. Temperatures were freezing, so wetness was clearly a death sentence. They stayed huddled against the walls and searched the horizon for hopefully more ships. I would have died right away because I would have gone to sleep. I would have gone to sleep. I'd be like, this is scary. (laughs) Yep. I would have gone to sleep and then just nicely froze to death. Freezing to death is not unpleasant. So, yeah, it would have felt warm. Yep. You would have just had like a nice dream and been that's uh, yeah. called like, it a day. This is great. Um, See you suckers later. Yeah. It's the long. Feel free to thaw my body later for nourishment. <laughs> Whatever I'm you need. Good. It's a long way to <laughs> temporary. <Yeah>. Goodbye. <laughs> right. So after, um, also, <laughs> this, this blows my mind. It still rained for a little while. So okay. they still had like kind of a means of water and the men aboard the boat set, were said to have been catching it in their shoes. Okay. And handkerchiefs. They would soak sure. it and then wring it out into their okay. mouths. I don't know how they didn't get dysentery. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, after the third day, the wine is obviously gone too. And they're yeah. trying to get whatever drops of water they can. By the sixth day, though, the rain stops altogether. The wine is gone and there is, quote, no way to catch fish or birds. But they're like, how is this possible? We're going to argue this in a minute because I, anyway. The crew of the Francis Spade was so desperate, they began to try and eat the horn buttons off their shirt to sustain themselves. So here we go. Here's my questions. I have a lot. They could construct an entire platform, Uh but they couldn't make a basin to catch water. Right. Or sharpen sticks to spears to throw at birds or fish. Sure. Or then use the wine bottles. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of... I feel like there was ingenuity to still be had and they didn't even try because glass from the portholes, mm-hmm. glass from the bottles, even if the bottles are ceramic, it's still sharp. Sure. There's bits of, you know, um, metal and there's just things that you could 
form tools from? I'm you sure there was hands. rope. You do have hands. And I'm sure there was rope. There's rope all over boats. Now, I would say, okay, so you don't, nor- okay. Sure. You're out at sea, yes. like out at, at sea. sea. Yeah. Way out you there. don't normally like do that kind of like the poke with the fish that like you yeah. see in Survivor. You don't yeah. normally do that like in the middle of the ocean. You normally do that when it's closer because you can like hit it. Right. Like, so I would say like normally you're using nets to grab, like but you have to go that's down. That's my other argument. Like, may, couldn't you have fashioned something that well, to maybe try? Didn't have the nets. Like, they had. because here's the thing, if there was netting, I would have, the first thing I would have done was be like, let's make hammocks that live above this That's water. That's true. But I mean, like, I don't know. Although, or maybe they just needed a woman's touch. I think they definitely did. Because yeah. there would have been extra, like, possible ragged sail sure. canvas or like just anything you could have tried. Mm-hmm. And okay, fine. No fish. Birds. Right. Birds I guess are they out landed, far. They swoop down to catch yeah. things. They're about, I mean, like, but this, the, every account says they didn't even try. Oh, they didn't try. No, they didn't try at all. They were like, there's no way we can do any of this. Oh, they were just in a depressive state. I immediately. Maybe they were all out of their Adderall. They, I know. They were all like really <laughs> crashing hard. I don't know. They were like, oh, there was no wine, nothing to live for. Yeah. Um, But they, it's because they didn't try for anything. Oh, also, man. this is like a hat wearing time. Did none of the hats make it? Pirates always have hats, no matter what happened. Well, Why they, don't their hats stay on? Well, you, but you said that they use their hats for catching water. Mm-mm, shoes. Oh, shoes. Which then shoes. their shoes are wet, and they're putting their feet into wet well, shoes. Well, I mean, they tipped over that their hats are going to fall off their heads. I guess. And float away. Pirates of the Caribbean, they all kept their hats on. Yeah, well, this is real life. If they had, like, the gentleman pirate, like, in Our Flag Means Death, <laughs> there would have been, like, this... They would have been on their way. They the would have been would reconstructed. Have been a lot nicer. Things. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It would have been great. They would have figured it out. Sadly, it's not. But my brain also says, like, you have wood. It's said that there was bits of wood all over. Construct a large box with, like, five pieces of wood. Line it. Stuff the little sides. Do what you can. You can at least collect some more water than you could in a shoe or a handkerchief. Yeah. They do not do that. Okay. I mean, like, sharpen a stick at both ends. Even the Lord of the Flies kids caught a pig and they were dumb 12-year-olds. Sure. I realize that's fiction, but still. Now, not these guys. They're like, nope, couldn't possibly. So for 16 days, they go on like this. No food, no water, nothing but standing around or sitting on a platform. And people rightfully begin losing their fucking minds, right? Uh For several reasons. Aside from the crushing sense of doom that comes along with a bird's eye view of one's own mortality and the thought that their loved ones would never know what happened to them and the possibility that they were just gonna live on that platform eating buttons forever, there was also dehydration, starvation, and salt poisoning to contend with. Yeah. None of these things are good. And they're not just physically uncomfortable, though they're, they definitely are. They're also mentally very challenging. Like this, mm-hmm. this kind of stuff does really weird things to your body. So here's what can happen. Starvation alone takes like a surprisingly long time to kill someone. Mm-hmm. I don't think we ever like that doesn't check in my brain. With If you have water, let's just pretend we have water for a hot okay. minute. An average adult human can survive anywhere from 40 to 70 days without food. Yeah. That is batshit bananas crazy to me. Mm -hmm. So think about that the next time you get hangry waiting for dinner. Like, you're you're okay. We talked about this when I used to talk to you about the fasting stuff. Oh, God, yeah. I can't. I can't do it. But so, so, okay, they have water and no food. Then at around the 15-day mark, which is where we're at, 15, 16 days, you'd be pretty low on body fat. So you'd be mm-hmm. cold. Your body would have begun kind of shutting down and essentially like slowly eating itself. You'd be depressed or angry, maybe apathetic, both, all three. Your emotions are going to be kind of all over the place, but most of your mental acuity is, is still there. Mm-hmm. You're not like crazy with hunger yet. Yeah. You're not doing well, but you're not like lost well, your and mind. you get and you get somewhat used to it mm-hmm. for a while there and yeah. then you yeah you go kind of back and forth yep i mean and, and i i think this is actually kind of worse because you feel really terrible but you're still pretty conscious of it yeah yeah but that's not the most desperate factor here let's add dehydration into the mix yeah that's right the rough one. that is the well then the salt this is going to speed the process along quite a bit humans are basically sentient water balloons with big opinions mm-hmm. so when their contents start to dry up things go south pretty fucking fast. 
Now, I know most people love to call themselves like, I'm a dehydrated bitch when they're on TikTok, (laughs) shaking the contents of their train to iced pistachio oat milk latte for fun times and laughs and giggles. But in reality, clinical dehydration is like fucking awful. Yeah. It's not, you're not jiggling ice cubes. And it's not going to happen because you drink only Coke Zero and pink vitamin water. Those things do have water in them. You may not be healthy, but you're not dehydrated either. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you cry all the time with no trouble at all. See that? Hydrated. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Moving on. Real and true dehydration can happen very fast. It takes a typical adult human anywhere from three to 14 days, which is a wide berth. Yes. Both of them are, to die from dehydration. Uh, I guess it depends on where you started from. Very true. So if they like somebody drank all the other bottles of wine before that, yeah, they might be fine. They might be okay, <laughs> or they were just like so bloated, just full of water. Yeah, <laughs> or they were on, on the other deck drinking their pee for a little while. I have no idea. Yeah, you don't know. You can't. Have, you you did this before. You could drink your pee like twice or something. <laughs> I think no. I think it's just the one time. The second time, okay, because you did this bit before. How many times you can filter pee before it kills you? <laughs> I think it's just the one time, and then the second time, it's not. Yeah. Oh, it's only good for one drink. Sorry, guys. I think so. Anyway. So anyway, it's not, a, they're not good days that you live with dehydration either. That sandpapery sense of thirst, it actually wears off in a day or two. Mm-hmm. But in its place comes what I think of as like your full body being concentrated. You're just like a concentrated mass. And I don't mean thinking really hard. I mean like you're boiled down. Mm-hmm. You know how when you leave Coca-Cola out in the sun for a few days, it turns to syrup? Let's imagine we're a can of Coke. Okay. Okay. After, it, it gets grosser. After 10 days without liquids, and there's a reason I'm telling you guys this, trust me, just stay on the ride, which is about where our sailor friends are at 10 days at this point, no liquid. You're going to be fucking wild. Your brain will have shrunk and mm-hmm. retracted from your skull like a yeah. little raisin. You will be experiencing thunderous headaches, obviously confusion, and possibly, if you're lucky, hallucinations. I mean, like, I would fucking hope I'd be hallucinating at that point in time. Mm -hmm. You also won't be able to pee, sweat, or cry, which could be a good thing if you're embarrassed by all your bodily functions like I am. Okay. No one would have to see you do any of those things anymore. Your eyes will also be sunken in and shriveled up, so you're going to look really scary. Yeah. Uh, And your vision's going to be weird. And all your fluids are concentrated down to extra, extra salty, which is really bad for your filtration system, like your kidneys and liver. Mm-hmm. So kidney stones are like happening. Mm. You, yeah, I know. You will have next to no lips left, like your lips mm-hmm. suck back, which is also terrifying looking. And your tongue is like a little piece of jerky, basically. Yes. No, yeah, no one's doing well. Your circulation will be horrible. So your finger and toenails are going to be kind of purple. And you won't even really bleed if you get injured because your blood, much like the aforementioned can of Coke, is going to be thicker and more scarce than usual. Yeah. Because, yeah, you technically have less blood in your body when you're super dehydrated. Death Mm -hmm. by dehydration is very similar to bleeding out. Right. Both of them cause something called hypervolemia. You guys can look that up. That's not for this week. I'm sorry. I do that for you, don't I? Just trust me. Blood shrinks and it's bad. (laughs) Let's use a metaphor, shall we? Here's where I'm going to get a little bit graphic about blood. And some people, myself included, hate that. Real talk. um, It is the greatest shame of my macabre life that I can't really handle blood. I can't, I can talk about it to a point. But if I see it, I uh, too much of it or my blood, I throw up or pass out. Mm, man. Yeah, I can't look when I get blood drawn. And when I had surgery on my thumb in 10th grade, I threw up when they took the bandages off. I, it's not good. I very, strong, I very strongly prefer Tarantino blood to Blumhouse blood when it comes to movies. If you know, you know. Anyway, if that's you too, just skip 15 seconds. Just okay. give a little skippity skip. And if not, here's your description. Have you ever experienced a situation where you cut yourself and it bleeds a lot, enough to run out uncontrollably and therefore the blood drips onto a hard surface like a tile floor or a counter while you're scrambling for a paper towel or like maybe a tourniquet, I don't know, but you don't realize you're making a mess. And then when you come back later after not dying, hopefully, the blood has turned like thick and sticky. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of gross. Imagine that still in your veins. Right. I know that situation has a lot to do with oxidization as well, but I'm looking to give you guys a horrible visual here, so cut me a break. If you skipped and you're back, great. The rest is now just a simple syrup metaphor, right? (laughs) Yeah, so one more, and all these are going to make sense, trust me. The other part of this explanation is this. If you put sugar water in a pot and boil it to create a syrup, you're just speeding up the process, right? 
when you boil for a little while, you're left with a syrup that's a lot less liquid volume wise than when you started. But if you really wanted to, you could thin that shit out with more water or lemonade or bourbon and patience. So you could drink some and be okay. However, if you leave the burner on and walk away, then accidentally get lost in like six episodes of Bob's Burgers or something. I don't know. You do you. (laughs) When you get back, the pot is going to be empty. I mean, there will be like a gross mess at the bottom. Uh, And if you guys missed it, you're the pot in this situation. So this is going to come back later. So they're all in really bad shape on this boat. But there's still a couple factors left. Okay. I hear my science-minded friends obsessively saying, um, it's not really super believable that all of them were on the high end of survival. How did they all make it 10 days without a drop of liquid? First of all, stop being so obnoxious. Mm -hmm. That's my job. Second of all, for a couple reasons. First of all, it was cold. It was real cold. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing to do. First, the easy one. Cold slows everything down. When you're cold, all your processes are slower. Mm -hmm. So it's going to go not as quickly. Uh, And it wasn't freezing, freezing. It was enough for them to be cold and slowed down, but not an ice cube. Right. Which can also sharpen them a little bit. Yeah. Like, that's why, like, those cold plunges, like, help, like, sharpen your brain a bit. Which is worse because everything's going bad, but your brain is still sharp. I hate that. Mm -hmm. But you're also not going to sweat. Right. Because you're not extending yourself. Exactly. You're not losing water through your skin. Mm -hmm. You've only just, like, you're just evaporating. You're just that pot boiling away. Mm -hmm. It also helps you not to have to like pee a lot. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So it's like a weird confluence of events. There are some microorganisms that, well, you can freeze them and they'll just go to sleep for like a thousand years until you thaw them out. Sleep. Cold is powerful and weird. Mm -hmm. Um, Why why do you think? Disney is cold. I just just can't say that. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Why do you think we froze Walt Disney's head? Just kidding. We didn't. That's not true. (laughs) Didn't we freeze his whole body? It's true. No, just his head is the rumor. That's weird. That he was like, just keep my head. You could put it on like an improved body. Okay. Oh, that's like the Futurama whole thing? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it didn't really happen. Oh. We don't know. Mm-hmm. In addition to the temperature, we have the fact that these guys are on a boat with no means of going anywhere or doing anything and they can't leave the platform. So they're just sitting there. Yeah. They're not expending any energy mm-hmm. other than the energy it takes to be alive and awake. Right. I know this was like... <laughs> In non-maritime conditions, this would be akin to like being chained to a wall sure, forever, yeah. basically. In a lot of deaths by dehydration, the in these cases, the victims are somewhere hot and dry. That's what you mm-hmm. usually see. Uh, and big, like a desert. So they've mm-hmm. walked and walked and sweated in the blazing sun and then they die. But that's not this. Yeah. We're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in January. It's cold and kind of cloudy, mm-hmm. but not that dry. And they had a couple of days of actually getting water. Yep. So it's okay. like the the air is probably not mm-hmm. totally dried out. So if they're 10 days in, they're really only like four, because wasn't it like six days or something? They didn't have water mm-hmm. anymore. So they're really only like four days. No, they're 16 days in. They oh, are 10 days. without water Oh, okay. at this okay. point. Okay. But the last threat is the sneakiest, and that is salt poisoning or seawater toxicity. Yeah. The ocean is salty, y'all. And our little water balloon bodies cannot handle that level of salinization. Mm -hmm. But when you are thirsting to death on the high seas, sounds sexy, but it isn't. It's easy to look at that big, giant ocean full of water. Exactly. And just be like, I'm going to just have a little drink. It'll be fine. I just want to have a sip. It can't be that salty. It's that salty, you guys. It is that salty. Have you ever done a saltwater diet? Oh, no. You just shit yourself. It's so bad for you. Yeah. Don't do that, guys. Don't <laughs> drink salt water. I mean, you can, but like, like don't. Thank you. <laughs> Your kidneys cannot handle that smoke, you guys. They just can't. <laughs> and this is not news, actually. We've known about salt water poisoning for like way, way longer than medicine has been yeah, advanced. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how long, you want to ask? Well, um, in the Odyssey, <laughs> like the oldest book in the world, yeah. when faced with the prospect of starvation, the sailors consider drinking salt water to be, quote, done with it. That's how they're going to kill themselves, by drinking ocean water. Quote, the temptation to drink seawater has always been the greatest for sailors who expended their supply of fresh water. So this is like a known factor. It's sailors that always end up doing it, obviously. And were unable to capture enough rainwater for drinking. This frustration was described by a line from the Samuel Taylor Coleridge epic poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Quote, water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink. Mm. Drinking salt water is awful in a lot of ways, but it really just speeds up the dehydration stuff with the added benefit of thinking you had a drink. Sure. You will be very sick very fast, and like you said, you're going to shit your brains out. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, that includes being agitated, hallucinating, having seizures, and going catatonic. So we're at day 15, no food, and day nine, no liquids. Things are not going well. The crew becomes agitated and competitive for space on the platform. Okay. They start getting real mad at each other. They're like, you are man spreading out too much. Sure. I'm going to push you off into the water and I'm going to take up all their just petty as shit. They are not happy. They start turning on each other. There's no rescue in sight. So in light of their desperate conditions, the captain decides it is time. He gathers the crew on deck and informs them that they have run out of options and it is time to invoke the custom of the sea. Mm -hmm. And now I will tell you what that is. (laughs) I think you've probably gathered by now that the custom of the sea is some form of survival cannibalism, right? Yeah. But what you may not have gathered is that it's real specific and has a lot of rules. Okay. In like books and it's like laid out, man. Right. Yeah. (sighs) Which is why he was so like nonchalant about like telling the other captains like we had to do the custom of the sea. And the captain was like, Like, yeah, got it. Yeah, I read that in the captain rule book. That's what you Mm got to do it. And these rules make it legal through maritime law. Yep. Okay. In other words, this happened enough times to merit organization. Yeah. They had to get it together. (laughs) Yeah. They can't be savages about it. No, they can't. Well, here's a little wiki roundup. Quote, this specific custom, which is also known as the delicate question. (laughs) (laughs) I know. Or the proper tradition of the sea. Specified that in case of disaster, when there was not enough food for their survivors, corpses could be eaten. If there were no bodies available for consumption, lots were drawn. So like draw a name out of a hat or like the shortest straw is what it was back then to determine who would be sacrificed to provide food for the others. So they're going to kill somebody to eat, not wait for someone to die. They're killing someone. As long as the lottery was fair, giving everyone an equal risk of dying to become food for the others, this was considered entirely legal and justified by the circumstances. On the whole, sailors and the general public, everybody knew and accepted this protocol of cannibalism to survive ship disasters. This sounds wild and kind of like something one might object to if their family member was eaten by their co-workers. But I assure you at the time, so long as the events went according to the rules and were properly reported after the rescue occurred, it was legal. But that doesn't mean that these cases never went to court. As you could imagine, the business of killing and eating people to survive was never really without objection or complication, right? Mm -hmm. Quote, the only cases when cannibalism in maritime disasters sometimes led to legal prosecution was when the lotteries were fixed or absent altogether in violation of the accepted custom. Such violations were nevertheless common enough. Captains and other crew members were often unwilling to put their own lives at risk as the rules of the custom demanded, instead choosing to sacrifice those they considered more expendable, such as servants, young boys, or passengers, to serve as food for the other survivors. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, guys. Captain Tim is going to have egg on his face in a minute. Sure. After invoking the custom of the sea, Captain Gorman qualifies their situation a little bit by saying that only four men on the Francis Bates should be eligible to die. He's like, well... You know, everyone else has a wife and kids. Mm -hmm. So we should be given more time on this earth because we have responsibilities and we're just better. The over they have they have people they are supporting. Sure. The overwhelming majority of wife and kid having men agree that this is right and fair, but they would, wouldn't they? But I'll go one further. Three out of four of the men who were eligible to die also agree that this is right and fair. They're like, yeah, I guess it's gonna have to be one of us. Oh, boy. Because maybe salt craziness has set in and other shriveled little brains can't handle it or other reasons that we're going to get to in a minute. But these three, like, willing possible sacrifices are all grown-ass men. The fourth is 15-year-old cabin boy Patrick O'Brien. I know, a decidedly not grown man. And he said, I think the fuck not. Okay. In a crazily articulate moment, Patrick O'Brien brings up two very valid points. One, just because he has no one depending on him doesn't mean his life is any less valuable. And that is arguable. Yeah, he could say that. I don't know. 
He's also <laughs> half the age of many of the men on that ship, which means he has a lot more life to live and sure. lose. I mean, he's considered a ch- child. He's a child and he really couldn't have been married or have children yeah. at that point. He was, I mean, I guess he could have, but like it was not common even then. And also has he like, you know, is he really ready to be slaughtered yet? Like, no, he, he is not. Meat? Well, also no. Uh, <laughs> He's too young. He's skinny to begin with. They He's ca- too young. Uh, and sure, he may only have his single widowed mother to mourn him. But she's already lost an awful lot. And one could argue that he would have to support her. Mm-hmm. So why should she be condemned to suffer anymore? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah, he is supporting somebody. He is. So if that's like what they're going on, like the supporting, then yeah. And the second reason is it's not fucking legal to thin out the death pool, period. The only time this is legal, the only way it can be legal is if every person on board is put in that lottery. Otherwise, you've committed a crime. Oh. That's the law. That's okay. the custom of the sea. That's how it goes. Gotcha. Maritime law states that survival cannibalism is only legal when everybody is placed in the lottery. Okay. So Patrick O'Brien is right, actually. Mm-hmm. This suggestion from Captain Gorman is not up to any code, sea or otherwise. And what they do next is illegal even in maritime apocalypse conditions. The men then gang up on Patrick and insist that this is the way it's going to be done. And not only that, but because he or argued, he has to draw straws for all four men. He's drawing all four straws blindfolded and on his knees on the deck. Mm. Again, they made this part up. Sure. You're not supposed to do that at all. It's not part of the ritual. Of course, there is a ritual. More to come. Most historians agree that the reason this was done aboard this particular ship, the Francis Spate, was because the lottery was rigged. Sure, yeah. So all those men said, yes, we will die if we must, because they knew they weren't going to die. Okay. They had already discussed it, and they knew who they were going to kill. Oh. Patrick O'Brien was not a popular member of the crew. Yeah. He wasn't even a full-blown crew member. That's why teenagers are rough. You're right. See? (laughs) Foreshadowing anyone. I'm just saying. (sighs) He had joined this voyage as an apprentice, Mm -hmm. so he wasn't very strong or well-versed in sailing. He also complained about being near near death occasionally. (laughs) How dare? (laughs) Because he was 15. Nobody likes a complainer, Patty. Mm -hmm. So eventually, they put him on his knees, blindfold him at knife point because, oh, I'm sorry. They had knives. They had knives, Leslie. Sorry. So they had yeah, things. They did. Yeah. They sure did have knives. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right. Mm-hmm. Didn't try to kill a bird. Didn't try to get a fish. Didn't try anything. They they just okay. held on to him. So unsurprisingly, Patrick draws the short straw. Mm-hmm. Oh, what a shock. He lost sure. and is sentenced to death. But he still didn't go quietly. He was like, fuck no, I'm not doing this. I don't want to die. Now, In this situation, the ritual calls for the chosen one being killed by exsanguination. They're bled to death because the crew who is very dehydrated, presumably at this point in time, drinks their blood and they want to be able to get as much as possible. Okay. Which is fucking brutal. Oh, man. They're also like kind of vampires. Um, Yeah, I was going to say, is like Dracula on this... (laughs) You know, ship. it just so happens that the Francis Spate in the cargo hold had Dracula's yeah. coffin. And he was like, whoa. Uh, uh, guys, I have I an am idea. The only one. <laughs> <laughs> I have a great idea. <laughs> I'm the only one who lives. <laughs> great. Good times. So, yeah, Patrick O'Brien was dragged to the predetermined place on the deck, held down, kicking and screaming as the crew attempts to cut his wrists because they do this slowly so they can drink his blood and they don't spill a drop. But they were having a very hard time doing it. Okay. Eventually, Patrick even tries to do it himself, but it wasn't working for him either. Because uh, remember the boiling pot and the yeah. can of Coke? Uh, Patrick's had reached the point of dehydration where his blood had turned syrupy and thick. Ugh. And he was like shrunken. It's just a pancake with syrup. <laughs> it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they couldn't get blood to come out. Even mm-hmm. through like trying yeah, to cut yeah. the veins, like, like nothing would come out. Mm-hmm. But undeterred, Captain Gorman then calls the cook to slit the boy's throat with his chef's knife. Okay. You know, that big yeah, big blade that could have whittled wood to a point to try and kill birds? Sure. Yeah, that one. That's the, that's the one. Yeah. Um, and the cook did not want to do this. Of course not. But eventually they said, well, uh, you can do it or we'll kill you. 
So he was like, I guess I'm killing this kid. So they placed his head over a soup tureen. Okay. Which would be very useful for like catching or filtering water or lots of uh, other things. Okay, so they have one of those. Yeah, they, okay. they sure do. Um, and the cook completes the task at hand. Slits his throat over the soup tree and the guys, some of them drink it. Some of them are like, I can't be doing that. Then they cut Patrick's body into pieces, mm -hmm. hang the bigger parts to save for a few yeah. days. And then they just fucking eat him raw. Like a vultures, like a like That's a pack so of vultures. Wild. Yep, they just descend upon this kid and eat him raw, like Shaun of the Dead when they all yeah. flock. That's well, I guess just... how are they gonna cook them? Can't. Yeah. Still though, but this was only the fifteenth day, aka the eighteenth of December. And if you're checking your math right now, oh, it's no. probably not quite mathing, right? Yeah. No, rescue doesn't come for another week, and three other men end up dead. Yeah. Oh boy. The crew isn't able to survive off wiry Patrick O'Brien for the yeah. next two days because this was a bad plan. If they it did was, say, let's yeah. kill this one, that was dumb. Right. So then on the 20th of December, crewman Michael Behane and cabin boy George Burns become, quote unquote, deranged from seawater toxicity. Because I guess the whole time they were like drinking a little salt water. Yeah. Or they weren't. We don't know. <laughs> this is just what they wrote down. Right. And so to spare them all uh, from dying, they are killed exactly the same way as Patrick O'Brien. So cut open, bled dry, cut apart, eaten mm -hmm. and raw. Terrible. But then after they do that, a third crew member just dies without any help at oh, all. Oh, no. Yes. But isn't that bad? That's like when, well, I guess if they do everything right away. I'm just saying like, had they waited one more day, they would have had a natural death and not had to kill those two men. Yeah, and they but isn't it, better, isn't it better to kill it like fresh than to take one that's dead? It's like chicken. Like, no. you don't want to eat like a dead chicken. I mean, well, no. But you have to kill it. No, we don't need something it. that's still, no. If this guy died like a minute ago, you, it's the same thing. All right. <laughs> I mean, that was a nice try, but no, they just were like, we're hungry and we hate you. Well, they just got an extra one then. They're like, it was nice to eat. We should uh, yeah. do some more of that. Okay. They did get an extra one. So for the next three days, the men ate all three of them until the morning of the 22nd or 24th, depending on the reports that okay. you read, some of each. When they had all gathered on deck that morning to draw another lot. Mm -hmm. So they're all standing where the captain of the Angarona can see them because they're picking another person to kill. Right, yeah. And they're like, wait, 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 wait. Both. <laughs> yep. Yep. I bet you there were some people on there that were like, that's not a boat, I swear. Let's pick somebody. Let's just eat you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. And so in a moment of, th they thought this was a good idea, the whole waving arms and legs. They're trying to grab attention, but they're also trying to be like, look how desperate we are. Yeah, people yeah, yeah, die. Yeah. But of course, if you're <laughs> seeing terrifying. that, you're like, no, you <laughs> killed people very clearly. <laughs> they weren't there. <laughs> Right, mine. No. So, look at these legs. No. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> look at these legs. <laughs> They're nice legs, right? Sea legs. Hey. That was their sea legs. Yeah. They got them. <laughs> so anyway, it, it did get attention, though. And they, sure. they did convey their own desperation. Okay. It did work. Yeah. Now, back to the Angarona. Once the ship arrives in Falmouth, Captain Gorman reports all of these events. So he goes to, like, the Maritime Commission mm -hmm. or whatever and says, here's what we did. We ate these guys. We're sorry. And maritime authorities go, okay, yeah, it's uh, this tracks. Wait, so, and then um, have a good day. The the one guy Palmer, the one that wasn't even like the ship, like wasn't oh, one of their wait. mates. <laughs> he's fine, right? Like they he, he lives, but he also comes in handy. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I would have thought they would have like eaten him first and been like this guy. For whatever reason, maybe he was like real fun to be around. Yeah, they or just... maybe they get, he gave enough money. Like maybe they were like. Oh, you I bought your know. way out. We, they, we don't like this loud one. And these two went deranged. Uh, yeah, so, you know. Yeah. But the captain didn't report things exactly as they happened because we did hear that letter, did he? Yeah. He's like, this poor man died on the 20th. Sure, yeah. Okay. Where his letter was lacking, though, a different newspaper did fill in with the rest oh, of the no. explanation the captain had given. And what our Canadian passenger <gasps> did not feel bound by duty to withhold. Okay. Because he's not... A crew member. He's not a sailor. Right. He bought his way on the ship. He does not have to keep secrets by any kind of ancient law. Sure. He can tell everyone. Yeah. And he did. So <laughs> here's, here's what this report says. And this isn't a newspaper. Okay. Just, just FYI. So you're doing this in a Canadian accent now? I can't do a Canadian <laughs> accent. Just imagine it's like a letter Ketty situation where they're like almost exactly the same. Okay. Um, Falmouth 
January 7th. The brig, the Angerona, uh, from St. John's, New Brunswick, arrived here last night and furnishes the following melancholy account. <laughs> melancholy. The ship, the Francis Spate of Limerick, T. Gorman Master, sailed from St. John's, New Brunswick on the 24th of November last, and on the night of December 3rd, she was struck by a heavy sea whilst lying to, which threw her on beam's end. By great exertion, the men cut away the weather lanyards of the fore and main rigging, which, leaving the masts unsupported, they were soon overboard. And she was righted. The men, it was the captain and one other guy. Yeah. The mate and two men were drowned. All the provisions were lost and everything movable on decks was washed overboard. They remained on this dreadful condition from the night of the 3rd to the 18th, where, finding it impossible to sustain themselves any longer without food, they came to the dreadful resolution of drawing lots, which should be killed to sustain the survivors. One poor fellow was eventually killed, and the survivors fed on him till the 20th, when another became deranged, and he shared the same fate on the 22nd. A provided occurrence prevented any more such heart-sickening necessities for on the morning of the 23rd, they were described by the brig Angarona being at that time, latitude and longitude, the captain and crew of the Angarona at the great peril of their lives succeeded in rescuing the wretched creatures from the wreck consisting of captain and 10 men whose miserable condition language fails to describe. Captain Jellard speaks warmly of the humanity and kindness of the crew of the Angorona, who treated them with brotherly hospitality during their stay mm-hmm. on board and landed them safely at Falmouth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was like, I can't say anything bad about these people because they did not expect to see zombies. Mm-hmm. So that's how it's reported in the newspaper at first, but it quickly devolves into like, oh no, they did all this crazy shit because mm-hmm. they did not keep any secrets. The rest of what we knew, of course, came from our Canadian friend. Yeah. But the destruction caused by the Francis Spate was not over. This is where my theory comes into play. Okay. Now, if you look carefully, uh, there are clues that maybe Francis Spate himself is uh, not the best guy and could be deserving of a little bitty curse. There are a few little things I haven't mentioned. First, Patrick O'Brien's, the cabin boy, his last words were that he wanted them to spare his mother the news of what became of him. And that if they did go through with this and they killed him and ate him, he would haunt every last fucking one of them from the other side. So I like that. Okay. And if you ask me, there were definitely some hauntings of anyone who touched the Francis Spade. Many of their surviving crew members were so damaged by their experiences aboard that ship that they could never work again. Some never even made it home, choosing not to travel but to stay there in Falmouth. In fact, funds were raised by the locals, kind of like a primitive GoFundMe, to like make sure they didn't have to work because they couldn't. A month after the crash, one of the surviving crew members who had barely spoken a word since he came ashore, went to a cafe in Falmouth, sat down, put his head on the table, and just died. Wow. Yeah. Francis Spade himself wasn't immune to the curse of his dreaded vessel either, but then again, he wasn't all that great, as I said. Francis Spade, the man, not the ship, was uh, one of the wealthiest self-made men in 19th century Ireland. He was a landlord, a magistrate, a ship owner, and a merchant. Spate made his mark on Irish history in many ways, but gruesome tragedy always seemed to bloom in his wake. Probably because he didn't really care how he made his money so long as he made it. During the famine, the Protestant ascendancy paid Francis Spate, so these are the people that want to get all the Catholics out of Ireland, They pay him to transport poor Catholics out of Ireland and take them to Canada with the Mm. promise of a new life. Okay. So these are like poor people that were undesirable in these landlords' buildings, right? Um, In reality, many of them got sick on the voyage and died or weren't nearly prepared enough to survive in the harsh Canadian wilderness, left with nothing but a little bit of cash and the clothes on their backs. They left everything they knew, so they had no support. And they couldn't go back. That's the other thing. There was no ship to take you back. You went there and you stayed. So he was just condemning people to death, a lot of them. Mm. Um, Francis Spade also would buy properties where the working class lived and then jack up the rent really high so that they would end up on the brink of eviction and then offer them transport to Canada, effectively getting them out and making room for the building to rent to like wealthy Protestants. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Because, uh, you know, he wasn't an awesome guy. 
Though Francis Spate didn't end up dying penniless of salt madness, he did own another ship that suffered a catastrophic crash. That's not his only terrible crash. This one was called the Derry Castle, after the town in which Francis Spate had built his own sprawling estate. Not an actual castle. The town is called Derry Castle. Mm -hmm. I was really confused. So, um, quote, on March 12th, 1887, the Derry Castle sailed from Geelong or Geelong, Victoria, still under uh, Captain Jeff. Captain Jeff, all right to Cornwall or Queenston County Cork, where she would receive orders for discharge. In the early hours of March 20th, 1887, eight days into her voyage, so the other one was nine, this one's eight, in strong winds and sailing at 12 knots, Derry Castle ran into a reef off Enderby Island and immediately began breaking up. Manned by a crew of 23, she carried one passenger, another one with one passenger, Mm -hmm. and a cargo of wheat. Only the passenger and seven, so the passenger survives again. Okay. It's eerily similar. Yeah. And seven of the 23 crew, crewmen made it ashore. At that time, the New Zealand government maintained a number of castaway depots on their sub-Antarctic islands equipped with emergency supplies. Unfortunately, the depot at Sandy Bay on Enderby Island had been looted. And all, all the only thing that remained was a bottle of salt. Oof. That's a slap in the face. That really is. The castaways constructed crude shelters and subsisted on shellfish and a small quantity of wheat recovered from the wreck. So these guys were trying. Mm -hmm. They were also on an island. On a cliff overlooking the water, they buried the bodies of their fellow crew members that had washed ashore. The grave was marked with the ship's figurehead. A box of matches proved ineffective at producing a flame despite drying, but the survivors, by detonating the charge in a revolver bullet, were able to start a fire. These guys really did it, man. Mm -hmm which they maintained until leaving the island. After 92 days, they discovered an axe head in the sand. And with just that axe head and the the wreckage, yeah. they built another boat. Oh, wow. Yeah, which became known as the Dairy Castle Punt. From the wreckage, two men navigated the boat to nearby Erebus Cove, Port Ross on Auckland Island, where they obtained supplies from the government depot there. The group lived in Port Ross until rescued by the 45-ton schooner Awarua on the 19th of July. Wow. These sailors didn't kill anyone and buried their dead. And they didn't, they didn't all suffer like horribly for the rest of their lives. They like went on to still live. So my, my. Just saying, maybe the the code of the sea is not great. Mm. Do we think that the uh, Dairy Castle was funded by the uh, Dairy Queen? I didn't even think of that. (laughs) Yeah, I do now. Yeah. I just, it's just all ice cream. Yep. I got back and they were like, ice cream for everyone! Yay! Yay! (laughs) (laughs) That's a much nicer ending. Sure. (laughs) We know that psychologically and physically these men on the Francis Spade, that is, paid a serious toll, but but many are still stunned to this day that they face absolutely no legal trouble. Well, that's the... That's the but they, didn't, they didn't exactly that's do it true. right, did they? In fact, the only one, this is terrible, who had any, like, moment in court whatsoever was Captain Gorman, and it was him who was doing the charging because Patrick O'Brien's mother went absolutely batshit crazy. Sure, yeah. She would not leave him or Francis Spade himself alone and harass them. She would just stand outside their houses day and night and be like, what happened to my son? What happened? Well, get the fuck out of your house. What happened to my son? Yeah. And they, I know, I totally agree. I agree 150%. She harassed them until they took her to court. And I believe she was fined and penalized for her actions. And none of them faced anything. Ridiculous. Yeah. So what became of the custom of the sea, right? Does it still exist in some kind of vague, watery, legal loophole? Maritime law is real and it's weird. So I genuinely didn't know going into this research if I was going to find out some real dark shit about cruise ships. Mm -hmm. So before I (laughs) proceed, I was like, (laughs) oh, no. Remember the one that like sunk in Italy and they were eating onions for like three weeks? (laughs) If the custom of the sea was still here. Yeah. So before I go any further, let me say that while it's, not any longer legal per se in a dry land court of law. It strongly suggested that if it does happen, you uh, should lie about it. Yeah. At this point in time. Okay. Yeah. Which brings us to the wreck of the mignonette, aka the one that ruined everything for everyone. 
Now, I bet you're wondering how long this whole custom of the sea business stayed above board. And the answer to that is until 1884, when the wreck of the Mignonette changed everything. Quote, the case of R versus Dudley and Stevens is an English case which developed a crucial ruling on necessity in modern common law, at the same time ending the custom of lot drawing and cannibalism. (laughs) Accused were two crew members of an English yacht, the Mignonette who in 1884 were shipwrecked in a storm some 1,600 miles off the Cape of Good Hope. After a few weeks adrift in a lifeboat, 17-year-old Richard Parker fell unconscious due to a combination of hunger and drinking seawater. And let me just say something that blew my mind, and I hope it blows all your mind, and you got to go with me. If that name sounds familiar, it's because Richard Parker is the tiger in Life of Pi. Oh, I didn't watch that. Oh, God. It's it's such a, a good allegory. Let it blow your mind for a minute. It's a guy stuck on a boat with a tiger, and he has the moral dilemma of, like, killing to survive, and the, the killer is what keeps him alive. And it wasn't on accident. This The, the guy that wrote yeah, it did yeah, it on yeah. purpose. For and sure. um, I just love smart people and art and learning things. And okay. I thought it just blew my fucking whole mind when I found that out. Interesting. Because I read it, and I was like, wait a minute, Richard Parker? Yeah. And I was correct. Okay. So back to human Richard Parker. Two of the three others on the boat decide to kill him and eat him because he's like catatonic with salt poisoning. The third man on the boat was like, I am not doing this at all. You guys eat him fine. I'm not doing it. And four days later, they are rescued. The case held that necessity was not a defense for a charge of murder. And the two defendants were convicted, though their death sentence was commuted to six months imprisonment. So they didn't draw lots. They just killed this guy Mm -hmm. because he was catatonic. In this case, the rules of the tradition custom had not been adhered to since no lots had been drawn. However, the judges made it clear that they did not consider necessity a possible justification for murder any longer, regardless of the circumstances. They did not consider consider killing anyone acceptable, even if this was the sole way to ensure the survival of the others. Instead, pompously, apparently, they declared that the right course of action under the circumstances would have been for everyone to starve to death. Okay, that's a little extreme. Mm -hmm. After this judgment, there were no more cases of openly admitted cannibal killings on board British or American ships. This does not necessarily mean that they no longer occurred, but the sailors had certainly learned that more discretion was now required Mm -hmm. since the custom had effectively been declared unlawful in the Mignonette case. In the 1890s, there were two more highly visible suspect cases of maritime hunger cannibalism but the survivors asserted that the Eaton had died a natural death and nobody seemed strongly inclined to prove otherwise and no proceedings followed. So does this still happen? I don't know. And if I did know, I sure as hell wouldn't say anything about it. There you go. Yeah. So The original don't ask, don't tell. Yeah, those people uh, were already dead when they ate them, if you ask me. All of, any, all of them, anytime. Yeah. Yep. So. And that's why I don't go on a cruise. <laughs> Because, like, they might eat you, but they won't they say may. anything about yeah. it. And that is the story of the wreck of the Francis Spate. Who, th- who thought that we would be talking about some, like, pro-life, <laughs> pro-choice? Yeah, I know. Here. It's a real wild scenario. <laughs> I mean, I guess these cases could be used in a court of law. Yeah. A lot of ways. But, yeah, the Life of Pi thing blew my fucking mind. If yeah, you guys have sure. seen Life of Pi. I have not, but that's interesting. It's a great movie. I know. I I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful film, but like, yeah. Once you know that it is actually based on a crumb of truth, it is insane. (laughs) So, toast. Toast, That's what I got for St. Patty's Day. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Poor, poor Patrick O'Brien. Sure, yes. And his mother. Who, bless her for being like, I will hunt you down and I will find the fuck out. Okay. Cheers. Anybody else? I, it's really hard for me to kind of think who came out okay in this situation because I kind of believe it was rigged. Yeah. I think they set it up. Um, I would say to the two ship captains for working together. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work. Way yeah. to go to the Angarona, all of its stunned ass passengers. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. For being like, yeah, we'll give you broth, but please stay mm-hmm. over there. You're terrifying. Mm-hmm. Is that brain matter in your beard? Don't tell me. I don't want to know. It's fine. It's fine. La, 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 la. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's our uh, our strange Irish tale for this week. And this is kind of a uh, Irish legend. It's a little lesser known uh, here, mm-hmm. but it is more well known 
over there. Okay. And uh, I feel like, even though I didn't come across a bunch of ghost stories about it, I feel like this is, like, rife for ghost ship lore. I mean, like, Patrick O'Brien yeah. said he was going to haunt them. Yep. And then, oh, and I didn't even, this is a, another PS on this story. Um, Captain, the Angarona, who rescued them, just a mm. year later, wrecked in and of itself. Oh. That ship wrecked, and a bunch of people died. It was carrying coal. And Captain Jellard, the captain of the Angarona, who rescued everybody, uh, later, I think in the 1870s, um, overdosed on laudanum and died. Okay. Because he had a lot of demons going on. Definitely some cursed action. Uh, that's what here. I'm saying. I think it was cursed. I think anybody who touched it ended up dead in a horrible mm-hmm. way. So, anyway. All right. Any, any other toasts? Nah. No? All right. You know what? what? I want to toast Trixie. I, I thank God, because otherwise... The Trixie, Trixie, I forget. It was Trixie this time. Right. She left, guys, so she she or, headed out. Or did she? Oh, no. Cheers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if we were bold enough to ignore the rules of the custom of the sea, we, we would be dead. dead. I mean, even if we if we didn't ignore the rules, we might be dead. <laughs> <laughs> I said I would have died in that life. You were going to lay down in a pool of water. And I was <laughs> just going to cold plunge until death. Happy St. Patrick's Day! Bye! Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the We Would Be Dead podcast. Hit subscribe now to never miss an episode. Rate and review our show on iTunes. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Would Be Dead Pod. And join our Facebook group to discuss the podcast and more. Why do you think we froze Walt Disney's head? Just kidding. We didn't. Yeah. That's not true. <laughs>